Hello everybody and welcome to another top 10 edition of Magic Mics, proudly sponsored by our Patreon supporters and CoolStuffInc.com where you can find cool stuff in stock every day and our co-sponsor CardHoarder.com offer you the best inventory prices and delivery of cards for Magic Online. I am Evan Irwin and we get started each week by saying hello to my two co-hosts, Aaron Campbell. Hi everybody. Ruben Bressler. What's up? How you doing? Everything is falling apart. It's fine. We're good. <laughs> we're, we're still here talking about Magic Cards. That's, that's positive. We're together. Keep it together. You guys His love will keep us together. That's right. You come here to hear us yammer about magic cards. We're doing that. We're doing this. We also begin with our choice of the top comment from last week in a segment we call Honorable Mention, where Ruben will tell us who was the most eloquent, letting us know what card we did not choose as one of our top 10 five CMC cards. Ruben? Well, Austin Tanner had a really excellent comment this week. They write, Ruben, Evan, and Aaron, you guys are my friends, right? Hey. One could even hmm. say you're like companions mm, wink mm, wink nudge mm. nudge know what i mean yorion sky nomad is where i'm going with this bit it's obvious recency bias however the card is nuts you just jam it in any sort of value deck and go to town drawing cards with omens or astrolabes bringing things back from the yard with ewit or resetting your planeswalkers yorion was easily in the conversation for banning during the most recent bnr and is in is the least hurt by the new errata. Mm. Imagine with Fires in Pioneer, where paying three mana does literally nothing if you can cast it for free. It was a part of the most powerful deck in Standard and likely would have won a Pro Tour if not for current circumstances. Oh, and I'm sure it will end up in a future cube. Mm. It speaks volumes to the current power level of Standard when compared to all other five CMC cards, but Yorion is a great card and deserving of a spot on someone's list. Speaking of Yorion, did you see the article that Nick Prince wrote for TCG Player recently? Where no. he wrote an article that was like, should you play Yorion? And the way that people on Twitter were hyping it up, they made it seem like it was this this manifesto with like lots of like, words. You, and you really, breaking. one of the greatest articles I've ever written. And then you click uh -huh. on it, it's literally one word of yes. <laughs> yes, period. Yes. It's so sure. brilliant. It, like, Nick Prince. it pisses me off that we didn't figure that out or come up with it or do anything like that, either ourselves or have a writer do it, because I can only imagine the traffic that it got. It turned into a fantastic joke. I loved it, and it's great. Um... All right, but yeah, Yurion Sky Nomad, for those who don't know, it's two Azorius mana, blue and white, and three generic, so five total, as it were. A four or five rare legendary bird serpent with companion. Now, companion don't work the same way it works on the card anymore, but whatever. Your starting deck contains at least 20 cards more than the minimum deck size, which means it needs to be 80 and constructed. Uh, it has flying, and when Yurion enters the battlefield, exile any number of non-land permanents you own and control. Return those cards to the battlefield at the beginning of the next instep. This card is stupid. I try yeah. I try really hard not to have recency bias, but because Wizards has just put the pedal to the freaking floor, it's it's, tough to it's happening like it's just it is definitely definitely happening um yeah. and my top 10 uh even includes i believe includes a a recent uh recently printed card yes it does so yeah, so that'd be kind of we're counting as recently printed but well, you know, i have an ikoria card or two in here i got an ikoria card it's, it's yeah. cool um but yeah so congratulations to them thanks so much for being a part of the show yes uh, yeah for, be sure uh, to, uh, well, Mr. Austin get Tanner. It, be sure to get it, Aaron Campbell, as quickly and as angrily as possible. Right. <laughs> Slam <laughs> that DM. Your... Just drop kick into the DMs. Just tag me hourly. Just 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 program a bird. Just trade a bird. <laughs> trade a pigeon. Tweet over and over. Before she gets the walls up to be able to block you. Yes. <laughs> Please contact Aaron on social media before she blocks you on all of them. Thanks again to CoolStuffing.com for sponsoring this giveaway. And stay tuned for our top 10 list this week. And maybe you can win next week's free gift certificate. Because we're talking about wedge cards, these are, you could think of them as the Cons Tribes. This is mm -hmm. Jeskai, Sultai, Mardu. Uh, triumphs. And, and, oh, no, and then the Triumphs, which we know absolutely nothing about because right. they had nothing <laughs> for them. It's fine. Uh, but yeah, but all, all the wedge cards that we're able yeah. to talk about, so that'll be sweet. Um, and uh, as I spoke a little bit in the, the pre-show, uh, we're in a weird position, you know? Um, uh, there's already other shows that are doing top 10s or top 8s or whatever, and there have been before us. It's not like we created this format. Um, but part of it is that because we've done it for as long as we've done it, I feel like we kind of run into a lot of the same cards sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so the first half of my list is definitely on the, I think these cards are cool and sweet and fun. And the latter half is more like, this is clearly like, you know, the best stuff that you could probably be doing in these types of colors or whatever. Um, but I had a good time going through these. These were really interesting. 
Yeah, I tried to pick cards I hadn't already picked before, but there weren't that many that I liked. So I did end up going back to some familiar wells, but um, I think this will turn out okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. and the other thing about this particular one being wedges, first of all, shout out to Wedge at the Manosaurus because mm. we're doing a wedges episode. Sure. I thought about making him my number one, but I didn't know if that was too. <laughs> Little... Be kind of silly, but I like it. In terms it. of pieces of cardboard printed with three color identities, there are only 90 cards that have casting costs of exactly three colors, mm -hmm. and only 145 cards with color identities of mm -hmm. exactly three colors. So we were gonna run into cards we've talked about before we it's were true. gonna run into each other we actually ran, didn't run into each other a ton which i'm a yeah. little surprised by yeah that's a good thing i thought we were gonna be all over each other on this list now as we get started here with our number 10 ruben you have your number 10 is higher is that correct now my number 10 we're starting off we're starting off strong my number 10 is higher on someone else's list fair enough aaron what's your number 10 it's going down i'm yelling teamer um, my number 10 is a recent uh, card um, that has, it has all the earmarks of broken things. Really? Nothing for the song? Not even, I, oh, Ruben I did. I facepalmed for about 10 <laughs> seconds. Ruben, Ruben got there. I'll take it. I'll take it. Uh, so this card just recently came out and it has all of the earmarks of a broken card. Like people looked at this and thought there's something here. I don't think anybody's quite agreed on what's going to come from this card, but I would be very surprised if this card was not a major player in at least one format. My number 10 is Song of Creation. Mm. Um, so Song of Creation is one colorless, a green, a blue, and a red, which is Teamer. Uh, it's an enchantment from Ikoria. It says you may play an additional land on each of your turns. Whenever you cast a spell, draw two cards, and at the beginning of your end step, discard your hand. Beautiful art by Noah Bradley. There's got to be something here, right? This is the type of card that's similar to Scape Shift. Mm -hmm. It's terrible, or it's the best thing you could possibly be doing. It's stupidly broken. You hate its face. You don't want to ever see it ever again. That's, I think it's more like experimental frenzy, like in the way sure. that just kind of keeps you going, but as one hell of a downside. I will say Song of Creation has the distinction of being maybe the only card that I can think of in which I've cast it at least 10 times and I've come nowhere close to winning any of those games. Aww. I can actually say uh, with 100% certainty, I have never lost to anyone who has played a Song of Creation against me in Limited. Oh, I beat yeah. them every single time. Every single time. Every it's time. not good in Limited. No. Much like Scape Shift, as right. a matter of fact. Um, but you're right. I think that you know you combine this. It's whenever you do anything. So you know once you start combining it with oh let's say Lion's Eye Diamond. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, uh, cheap ca uh, cantrips that draw additional cards, you know. Right. Uh, some sort of teamer combo deck, something like a Heartbeat of Spring style deck from way back in the day might work with Song of Creation. Yeah. Fair enough. All right. It just so needs the right kind of tools to be able I'm to like, do I don't, something. I don't want it to get the right kind of tools. It, the, they they keep those in the tool shed. No. This card, <laughs> that's not a, that, that card this can This card dump. would be really good in like the standard grape shot decks. Oh. You know, let's, let's cast Empty the Wards like for eight million. million. Maybe? Like, there's got to be something you can do. Woof. My number 10 here is a super fun card. I've loved this little dork ever since he showed up. Absolutely, like, a adorable but kind of like cute but also got like ferociousness or whatever in there as well because it's because it's a goblin right it's a goblin a goblin berserker i gonna get you um and i just love the name can you not every you can't not love ankle shanker yeah. it's ankle shanker just say it out loud ankle shanker it's so good it's got such a good flavor onto it it's a red black and a white and two generic mana so five total for a two two rare with haste and when it attacks creatures you control gain first strike and death touch until end of turn not only is it cool and it's fun and it's neat it's a killer in limited this card was a bomb in limited and it's super fun to just you know make your team basically unblockable yeah giving smaller creatures death touch is, is really a lot of people's worst nightmares you know we've mm. talked about this before you know yeah you can have a grave titan with six six death touch or you can have four one one goblins coming at you you know with first strike and death touch you are absolutely not going to block and so i love everything about this card it's very mardu it's very goblins mm. um you know you could pair this with like pony back brigade and have a really yep. really good time mm -hmm. um, i just love it it's so good. i love the style of the uh tarkir goblins like mm -hmm. being little furry, you know, gremlin 
people. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and Ankleshanker, first of all, I think is one of my great uncle's names. Pretty sure he's <laughs> great, un- great uncle, great uncle Ankleshanker. Great uncle Ankleshanker, um, got it. Uh, and yeah, this card is just a nightmare to deal with in combat. I mean, a two-two for five. Obviously, it's not going to get there and constructed, but. I, this is a card I'm not sure I've ever lost if I've cast it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. True. And I appreciate the art direction here that really emphasizes the height difference. You know, you see everything in the background being so much taller yeah. than this goblin right here. And that's a really neat little catch. But he will get your ankles yeah. and shank them. <laughs> One of my favorite battle bots from back in the day was Ankle Biter, if anybody remembers battle bots. He was in the lightweight division. Yeah. No. Ruben, what's number nine? My number nine, nowhere, I mean, this is this is something whose ankles are probably towering above the Shanker, um, as this is one of the most hyped cards that came out of Plane Chase 2012 when it came out. People were really excited for Maelstrom Wanderer. Um, and to this day, it's a very popular commander card. It's true. Maelstrom Wanderer, five colorless, green, blue, red, for a 7-5 legendary creature elemental, Creatures you control have haste, already off to a good step, which means that it itself has haste. And it also has cascade, comma, cascade. cascade. Ooh, when you cast yeah. this spell, exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a non-land card that costs less. You may cast it without paying its mana cost. Put that exile card on the bottom of your library in a random, the, sorry, the, uh, the other the exile, exile cards. cards on the bottom of your library in a random order, then do it again. So this is very, you know, popular with mana rocks and cultivates and, and I mean it's a fifteen dollar card. Oh yeah. It's been printed three, four, five times and it's still fifteen bucks for a reason. Yeah. Sometimes Seize Play is a dread return target in Dredge, um, especially now that it's green and you need something you can pitch to force a vigor, you can just whoop. It's <laughs> wow. fair. And I mean this is this is one of those things where it's like that name is not really a legendary creature, right? right. This is we're having this a questing another, beast moment right we're here. We're having a questing beast situation, right? Maelstrom Wanderer doesn't sound like a legend, like so and so, comma Maelstrom Wanderer, you know, or the Maelstrom Wanderer, yes, like the Gigantoplasm, yes, yes, the so, Mimeoplasm, the Mimeoplasm, the Mimeoplasm, yeah. Mimeoplasm, that's what I meant, yeah. absolutely. So, uh, but this card in and of itself is just, I, I mean, you just imagine you get two free spells with a seven five and creature you control, including itself, is. Hasty, like okay, that card's nuts. It's definitely a grown worthy card. You know, when you do see it come out in Commander, it does feel like the, the tide of the game has changed when you're like, Oh, that's a Maelstrom Wonder. <laughs> Two more things are happening, God help us all. Aaron, what's number nine? My number nine is also a Commander All Star. I was originally printed in Commander 2011 and um, just happens to have all the right stats, very quickly gets out of control. Uh, my number nine is Animar, Soul of Elements. Mm. Um, so Animar is one blue, one red, and one green. It's a legendary creature elemental, which is a little baby, just one power, one toughness. Has pro white and pro black, which are two of the most common colors of removal in Commander. Um, and it says, whenever you cast a creature spell, put a plus one, plus one counter on Animar. And as if that's not enough, Enough, creature spells you cast also cost one colorless less to cast for each plus one plus one counter on Animar. Um, mm. So if you're playing this, you're probably playing a deck full of creatures. They're all very, very expensive normally. But when Animar is around and it's probably not going anywhere because of the types of protection that it has, um, you know, your creatures are coming out at a massive discount. And so um, this is a deck that can spiral out of control very, very quickly. Um, it can recover quickly because Animar costs so little to play. If you do happen to deal with it, they can just redeploy it anyways and so i'm i'm very afraid of this commander and i absolutely pay it the respect it deserves when i'm playing commander yeah. i mean you know speaking of discounts thanks to the mystery booster you can get one for about eight bucks nice instead of like 13 or 14 mystery lord was but, very good for reprints yeah i mean before masters 25 this thing was like 40 or 50 bucks i was gonna say it was crazy was the yeah. most popular of the team or commanders i think i think so uh, and because people would build morph decks yeah. just play a bunch of morphs for free they would play all their Eldrazi's because you could discount all the Eldrazi cards. It was it was a wild centerpiece. Yeah, this card is terrific. And honestly, it just it kind of makes me just miss Peter Morbacher. Peter Morbacher Peter Morbacher had a gigantic, huge public falling out with Wizards of the Coast over payment to artists, and it mm-hmm. ended really poorly. Uh, and as such, he won't be making any more magic art and hasn't for a very long time. But he does have his Angelarium like thing and world right. and stuff that he works on, so he can still uh, still get by with that. 
Uh, let's see here. My number nine. This is a, a more recent uh, entry. This was from, from just last year, from Commander 2019. Um, but you can't help but look back at the past and see how Wizards made legendary cards from these legendary characters, and they sucked. And they were terrible. <laughs> and they learned they should not do that because when you make crappy, sucky cards, no one gives a crap about the character anymore. So make some good cards out of them. And they will. And so they decided to go back and make one out of one of the coolest, awesome villains in Magic history in Volrath the Shape Stealer. Yes. It's a blue, black, green, and two generic mana for a 7 5. That's a 5 mana, 7 5 mythic legendary <laughs> shapeshifter. At the beginning of combat on your turn, you put a minus one, minus one counter on up to one target creature. And for one generic mana, colon, until your next turn, Volrath the Shape Stealer becomes a copy of target creature with a counter on it, except it's a 7 5 and it has this ability. He can shape shift yeah. into anybody. Everything's always a 7 5, so it's gigantic. You can put it on something with trample and get it back. It makes them smaller so they can't block the 7 5. Like, right. there's so much awesome going on in this card. I just love it. This is what we should have been looking at 15, what, 18 years ago, whatever it was. That would have been sick. Kind yeah, 20 this is years a card ago. that you can either use to punish your opponent and kind of, um, you know, whittle away at their creatures, or you can also do it to your own things um, and come up with some really broken combos. Uh, Tomer from MTG Goldfish, um, he posted a deck uh, with this commander shortly after it came out, and it was just busted and super fun. I love the art on this one, and I'm always happy to see Volrath. He's one of my favorite villains of Magic Lore. Yeah, the fact yeah. that you can one, cult, one mana and just keep turning him into different creatures the whole time, just for whatever you need. That one's got reach. Thanks. I'll take that one. You know, it's amazing. I really like that Volrath steals the shape, but ends up bigger than the opposing creature. So if your opponent has this really crazy 8-8 eight, eight, and you turn it into a 7-7, seven, seven, Volrath doesn't get the counter. So it stays an 8-8. Eight, eight, so you can get into the red zone with impunity. Well, but uh, it's addition, a, it says it says a 7-5, though. Well, okay. If they have a, a large creature, right? Um, then then it can shrink, you know, whatever it, it turns into. Right. Uh, and also, the combo between the two abilities is nice, but the fact that both abilities are good on their own is also nice. You the don't only necessarily. To this... I'm sorry. No, you're good. I was just gonna say the only downside to this is that there are so many good Sultai commanders out there already. You know, you have Maldrotha, you have Mimeoplasm. Um, you know, it's it's very tough competition, and so I feel like this one just doesn't get the the credit that it's due. Yeah, and it's just, you know it's less than a buck. It's affordable uh, for yeah. sure. Uh, so you can get out there, and also like the fact that it works so well with ability counters from mm, uh, Ikoria. Yes. It just says a counter. It only needs a counter of any right. type, energy counter, charge counter, whatever it happens to be, and giving it a first strike counter, and then he copies it. That's nice. super dope. I can copy a trade caravan that has a caravan counter on it. Mm -hmm. All it needs is a counter. So we went here to number eight. Aaron, what's number eight? My number eight is a card that I didn't expect to have any sort of longevity past standard. It's still going for less than a dollar, but it has become a staple of the modern humans deck specifically. Uh, my number eight is Mantis Rider. Um, mm -hmm. So Mantis Rider is one blue, one red, and one white, which is Jeskai colors. It is a creature type human monk uh, with three power, three toughness, and is flying vigilance and haste. Um, and so you can, you know, violin to this. You know, they play a lot of the rainbow lands. So you can cast mm -hmm. this and before you know it this thing gets really big between the Thalia's lieutenants and things like that um but I just I didn't see this coming just like you don't mm -hmm. see it coming a lot of times um it also is is a neat little form of removal against planeswalkers because a lot of times you'll play a planeswalker you'll minus it and then your opponent will slam this and then just get in there and then your planeswalker is gone so mm -hmm. it's just a really versatile threat um that takes to the air deals with things in a way that humans normally humans is good at coming up the ground um but sometimes they can go airborne and when you do you got to deal with this right away it does plug a lot of holes for humans because it has flying it has haste it's a three drop which you know the three drops that you have are sort of board control three drops like reflector mage and so this is doing so many things it's very strange that this ended up in humans to I mean, all it does, as the saying goes, is it attacks and it blocks, right? But it does both the turn that it comes into play because it has haste and it has vigilance. So yeah. I'll take my lightning angels cheaper with one less point of toughness all day yeah. if I can just have to pay three mana for them. So Manus Rider was terrific in standard and stays terrific in the humans deck, which is really interesting because 
also like it's less than a buck, but you you can't play with less than four. Like they play with four right. mantis riders, right? Like it's yeah, it's a full boat there. That said, Ruben, what's number eight? You may take your lightning angels with one less <laughs> toughness. Oh. I'll take my lightning angels original recipe. Oh, I right? see. Yeah, my number eight is lightning angel. Nice, it's good timing. Colorless like blue, red, white for an angel. Mm -hmm. It's a 3-4 with flying, vigilance, and haste. Originally a rare from Apocalypse, reprinted as a time-shifted card in Time Spiral, also in one of the dual decks and from the Vault Angels. Saw a bunch of competitive play when it was in Standard, I think both times, but yeah. primarily when it came back uh, as a time-shifted card, it was in like the Blink Patriot decks mm -hmm. that were coming around every once in a while, and the Angel Fire decks also used it as like a Jeskai mid-range kind of threat. I definitely slammed many a lightning angel into the red zone uh, when it was time shifted because I never got to play with it back in Apocalypse, which was great. And and around those days, around that, those times, uh, that was a mana cost that was very aggressive. Like, you mm -hmm. know, they, there was only so many pushes in the creature power curve back then, and they made you aware of it because you're like, wow, you're getting all that for four mana? Ooh, what, what, what's going on in standard? That's crazy. Right. Now, They're I'm never going to get sure. crazier than that. We, we talk about the cons right we talk yeah. about the triomes but the originals were anna Seta, dega mm -hmm. necra and raka i remember that um mm -hmm. and and that's where apocalypse was when you sort of had those combinations and i had a raka 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 deck <laughs> that had wild research and Lightning Angel, and Rock Evolver, and a bunch of really cool stuff like that. Oh, the Volvers. Those were very interesting. <laughs> so for my memory, this includes my only entry uh, from a recent set, this of course being the most recent, which is Ikoria. Um, I have spoken a little bit about this card before. Uh, it's definitely one of my favorite cards. It is, it is it is hard to describe. First of all, thank God Fires of Invention is out of here. That, was, that card is so stupid. Because for free, for free, you could get a spell that destroys all of their non-land permanents. Not yours. All of theirs. Everyone's with Ruinous Ultimatum. Mm -hmm. Ruinous Ultimatum is two black, two red, three white for a rare sorcery that destroys all non-land permanents your opponents control. Already bumping up over a dollar. The foils are headed towards five bucks. I would suggest you get your foils, get many of them, put them in a closet. Let's talk in 10 years because this stupid spell destroys everything they have. Go away. You're done. Yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs> it's nuts. I didn't think we would see something like this in standard ever again. Like, this is really, this is dangerous. <laughs> it's as long as it doesn't destroy lands. Yeah. They can still play magic. They can still yeah. play their spells. But my gosh, it is a beating this card is a monster beating mm -hmm. one Very time i was yeah. able to cycle a boon of the wish giver mid combat with a unstable cyclone in play and cycle into my ruinous ultimatum in draft uh that deck had three ultimatums in it and i lived the dream twice i think oh my god it was adorable and the animation on arena is really good too um, nice. of the or of the new ultimatums this one seems to be the one that has the best application mm -hmm. um uh, for constructed although genesis ultimatum i think is the one that has seen the most constructed play thus far hmm. um uh but this one certainly is just an absolute well they're making mana cost like mean things again so maybe this will actually you know come right. back into it versus fires which is everything's free who cares yeah, do whatever exactly. Um, let's move on here to number seven. Aaron, what's your number seven? My number seven and my number six are both higher on somebody else's list. Duly yeah. noted. Yeah. Ruben, what's your number seven? Now, so I have a number seven. And I I might get grumped at for this because it's a mana dork that you don't need the three colors to play, but it's got the no, no, watermark. No, it's got the watermark. It's got, you know, it, it, it specifically references three colors and it's in the MTGO cube. Uh, it's Rattleclaw Mystic. Um, Rattleclaw Mystic is a colorless and a green for a human shaman. It's a two one that taps for green, blue, or red. It has a morph cost of two colorless. And when you morph it face up, it adds green, blue, red to your mana pool. This card uh, is this, super weird. 
It's super I never strange. got this card. I was just like, why would you morph it? I know, because you get an extra well, mana out of it, you right? You get an extra mana out of it. And you get yes, the right mana. It's a lot of work. It's it a, is lot a lot of work. work. You got to go from, this ramps you from what? Three to six? To six, that yeah, right? because it, when you flip it over, you get three mana, and then you can tap it for right. the fourth mana. So you're really getting four mana out of putting three and then two over. So right. it was, I mean... These are almost like this card has so many different things going on that it's hard not to see play. I think it's a mana dork, but it's also a morph card, but it's also a ramp, which gets you all the things you want from a green mana dork that you, you want. You're able to bluff them out with what you know could be under there as a morph. Uh, yeah. I, I loved this card when it was in standard. And somehow this one didn't really like get there mm -hmm. so much in constructed. I mean, it won a couple of GPs in in like various decks but literally any two mana mana dork would have done exactly the same yeah. thing um i mean it, sure like, but and i would have thought that there would have been something specific about rattleclaw that would have led to it taking you know taking flight but it never really happened yeah i mean it, it did fine it was in some green red devotion decks and some team yeah. or mid-range stuff i mean uh, i've re re returned a death claw raptor or whatever the heck that card was called okay um death mist raptor death, death mist raptor. raptor every once in a while with this mm. kind of card but it's fine you know. so uh my number seven here is a I, I guess it's it's a classic at this point quite frankly um been around a very very long time uh been reprinted a few times and i think in a good good way because uh, as i recall this was very expensive for a while but then they put it back into commander 2016 they put it into the anthology and it feels like the price has gone down enough and honestly because i think other commanders that we'll talk about later have gotten more you know sort of interesting and exciting but you got to give it up for the og which is gave guru of spores the is green that how you pronounce it is it? I don't know. Oh, I don't know. I just love how you're hearing how, because people have different takes on it. So I just love hearing how people. I I just, I just went, you know how I go. Cali up, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> Gave Guru of Scorbs is a green, black, white, and two generic mana. So a five mana, zero, zero legendary fungus shaman. It enters the battlefield with five plus one, plus one counters on it. For one generic mana, you can remove a plus one, plus one counter from a creature you control, colon, to create a one, one green sapperling creature token. One generic mana, sacrifice a creature, colon, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature. So the counters start making the creatures, and the creatures start making the counters, and you, you're just flip flying everywhere. And I have seen some super cool cool uh gave decks and commander and i think they're super awesome and this is the type of card that wants that gets me interested in commander because like the yeah. the, the possibilities on this thing are just insane like it's just yeah, crazy yeah right. we also got a bunch of new sapperlings with dominaria so i know mm -hmm. that inspired some people to get into the the gave game um you know you can do a plus one plus one thing you can do a sapperling thing there's so many things you can do with this and yeah it's definitely a build around card gorgeous art mm -hmm. um i've always wanted to build a gave deck but i'm just like I, I, all the Gave decks I found just seem to be the same. So I'm just like, I mean, you clearly have a theme here, like built into <laughs> the card. Right. Um, but I, I, I keep, I'm keeping my eyes peeled. So if I find a really sweet Gave list, I will absolutely get on board with it. I'm being told by the internet that it is pronounced Gave. You is are it Gave? Okay. The uh, American pronunciation is Gave. Okay. But uh, much like the plant Agave, the art Ooh. is supposed to. Uh, be reminiscent of an agave plant and so it is okay. agave Makes nice. sense. Well, from the we yaki which is a native american dialect oh okay nice let's be here to number to look cactus like number six ruben watch your number six my number six is a card i've never had the pleasure of casting dot 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 in this form i have i have dealt three damage to any target and gain three life for a red and a white mana many many times in my life but i've never flashed back a smiting helix <laughs> however <laughs> smiting helix is in the mtgo cube and yeah. so i thought that it was deserving of a reference here on the list mm. uh it is three colors and a black for a sorcery from modern horizons reprinted in the mystery booster deal three damage to any target and you gain three life flashback red and a white mm. This is the flashback, um, uh, Lord God, what's the name of that card? Lightning uh, Helix. Lightning Helix, thank you. The, this is the flashback Lightning Helix. You get the three damage, you get the three life, you get it all together. This is sort of like, because it's in Modern Horizons, they just don't care. Like, yeah. you're getting so much above rate in this card. It is unreal. Like, even yeah. even by Modern, you know, Horizon, or Modern Horizons standards, it's, it's kind of up there. 
Yeah. yeah, I feel like that there is there are three and four mana black mono black spells that mm-hmm. do this uh, at sorcery speed. Sure. Um, the flashback cost to be able to do it again at sorcery speed, both a bonus and a detraction from the card. I think mm-hmm. that it's a really well designed, really well balanced version of the lightning helix effect. This uh, my number six, and uh, we spoke about it a little bit before. Uh, this I think was the original. OG, because the first Commander set was 2011. Is that right? I believe that it was, was 20. Was it 2010 was the first one? And then they started numbering them by year the year after. Um, it could have definitely been the second one. Um, but certainly in the first or second release of the Commander product, I felt like there was no card that they made that they made specifically for Commander. And this came out in Commander 2011. So this was early in Commander's life, whether or not there was one before it. Um, where I was like, oh my God. The only way this card exists is because you say it's only available in Commander Legacy and Vintage because the Mimeoplasm is ridiculous. Yeah. This card is absolutely insane. It's a blue, a green, a black, and two generic mana for a mythic legendary ooze. It is a 0-0, <laughs> zero, zero, but as it enters the battlefield, uh, you may exile two creatures uh, from your from graveyards, any graveyards. From graveyards, yeah. If you do, it enters the battlefield as a copy of one of those cards with a number of additional plus one plus one counters on an equal to the power of the other card. Jesus. It is a giant monster staple together. This is, you know, this is like essentially um uh, not morph. This is a, a mutate before mutate was was mutating. You were able to take yeah. creatures and kind of stick them around. Yeah, melds yeah, is yeah. very similar. Uh, this card was super cool. I remember I had a giant foil version of this on my desk for years and years. Uh, I think this card is great and I love it. That's all. Yeah, this card is absolutely wild. Um, there are a number of combos that you can do yeah. with the Mimeoplasm that are instant wins, mm-hmm. I believe. You're not doing anything uh, fair with the Mimeoplasm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> certainly not. Not the least of which is uh, you, I think it's you uh, get plus one, plus one counters equal to Lord of Extinction. Oh, Lord. Which is the oh, total sorry. number I didn't of plan cards. That. <laughs> That's pretty good. The total number of cards in all graveyards, mm-hmm. right? And then you get a murderous red cap. Has the ability. Mm. I so, think. Uh, yeah, so cards it's that are used with it. Uh, Lord of Extinction hangs out yeah. around the Mimeoplasm. Buried Alive hangs out sure, around yeah. the Mimeoplasm. Um, lots of good ways to get things you into can your also yard. Do things like Triskelion. Oh, yeah. Um, always. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know. If, I don't think Suture Ghoul works. Think of Acidic of Slime, by the arbitra- way. That's a good one. That's a Arbitrarily one. large creatures that just sit in your graveyard mm-hmm. um, that, that have that Sultai uh, color identity to be able to get a ton of plus one, plus one counters and then fire them off with some yeah. other way. Yeah, and then most recently they've been using Titanoth Rex, which is an 11 oh. 11. With oh. cycling. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. With it's trample. In graveyard. Yeah, that's it's right. Easy to put in your graveyard. Okay. I'll take it. So that's sweet. Let's move on here to number five. Aaron, you've been sitting out for a while. What's number five? So speaking of soul type things, I'm a big believer that an X spell should be over the top. Like if I'm gonna pay X for anything, I want it to be big. I want it to be backbreaking. I want it to be awe inspiring. Um, and my number five certainly does not disappoint. I played it for a little bit in standard when we had that crazy summer. You know, summer you get that that point in the summer where everything's legal. You got two months to play with all your toys. Um, and I absolutely tried to make this work in standard. Uh, my number five is villainous wealth. Mm-hmm. Um, so villainous wealth is. It is X, a black, a green, and a blue. It is a sorcery, originally printed from Khans of Tarkir. It says, target opponent exiles the top X cards of their library. You may cast any number of spells with converted mana cost X or less from among them without paying their mana cost. So we had all of the dictates in standard. Um, and so you'd play Dictated Karametra, you'd play Dictated Crufix, and you'd play this really broken, you know, kind of Sultai control deck. You'd ramp into your mana very quickly, and then you would fire off a massive Villainous Wealth and then use your opponent's own cards to beat them. Uh, this is a card that Jeremy Noel loves to play with in Commander. Uh, you can oftentimes find him tweeting about this with Nick's Bloom Ancient um, as a way to make a ridiculous amount of mana. Um, it's found a bit of a new life in Commander, but, you know, even though I didn't win many games with this deck, I have a lot of fond memories of just the things that I was able to flip and be like, oh, I'm sitting on a board full of your own plays walkers. Thanks, friend. <laughs> um, and it feels really, really good. 
Goodness gracious. It has been almost six years since we've been to uh, Tarkir, mm -hmm. which is kind of amazing in and of itself. Mm -hmm. uh, Villain's yeah. Wealth is one of those cards that it's nice to kind of really give a, a unique flavor to what yeah. Sultai was sort of trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, right. You know, very much sort of messing with your opponent, and it's kind of taking from your opponent, which you really sort of very flavorful in that way. Uh, this is a super duper cool card. It's also mm -hmm. a really, uh, it, it, I have ended up with a lot of decks in the uh, Vintage Cube where I had a really good storm deck with no storm cards in it. And I had to resort to villainous wealth for like 30 amazing. to win that game. Uh, and those decks are fine. Like it's one say, of the better. Still win. Yeah, you're still going to win. Villainous wealth is one of the better win conditions in storm in the queue. Yeah, it's true. Do it. Yeah. Nice. All right. Uh, Ruben, watch number five. Well, number five is the first card on my list that is on a banned and restricted uh, list somewhere. Not a lot of three color cards end up on banned and restricted lists somewhere uh, because they're very difficult to cast. But if you have eminence, you don't need to be oh. cast at all, do you? Edgar Markov is my number five. Mm. It is, of course, banned in 1v1 commander. Uh, three colorless red, white, black gives you a legendary creature, Vampire Knight. It's a 4 4 with eminence. Whenever you cast another vampire spell, if Edgar Markov is in the command zone or on the battlefield, create a 1-1 one, one black vampire creature token. It also Eminence. has first strike and haste for whatever reason. And whenever Edgar Markov attacks, put a plus one plus one counter on each vampire, counting himself, mm -hmm. you control. Yeah, Eminence is stupid. Uh, most stupid. commander players agree that it was a bit of a mistake. Um, you know, the fact, and Edgar costs a lot. You know, Edgar costs six in commander. And so a lot of the vampires that you're running with are quite cheap. And so, you know, when you're playing your Falcon Wrath Aristocrats or your Falcon Wrath Nobles or whatever it might be, you know, you're gaining a lot of value out of those cards. And then when he is ready to enter the board, all of those little creatures suddenly get really, really big. And so um, the vampires deck in commander is very scary. He's the progenitor of the Markov vampires and specifically Soren Markov. Um, um, and just, it was really nice to see this card because that's the nice thing about the commander sets is you get to see these characters that you've only seen in flavor text that you've only read about in the story. <laughs> just say read about in the stories. Remember when we got stories? Um, and and so, you know, Eminence is just really, really a backbreaking mechanic and just a really, really powerful card. Yeah, I remember when we didn't have to buy like ebooks to read the story I mean, of magic cards. Read, read about it in the reviews that jay and ellie writes i like how <laughs> that's like um, where i get my stories anymore so there's no doubt to me that somewhere in wizards exists a spreadsheet and on that spreadsheet is all the characters that have been mentioned in, in flavor text and never seen or heard of ever again because yeah. it's time to make some cards for them when you get back to the commander hole i'm looking and forward to that mr lost spoons when we <laughs> go back to dominaria that's gonna <laughs> be a good one yeah. Um, let's see what other good ones do we got. There's there's some really interesting names from back in like Mirage mm -hmm. that you're like who? Why? I mean, Massacre Girl, right? Like came out of right, nowhere, and sure. that was a big one. Well, uh, Afari, uh, yeah. Tales, the author, uh, you know that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they yeah. Edgar Markov itself, big, uh, big big well to draw from. There yes. Yes. I figured out the right analogy. Yeah, I was working toward it. I was like the commander hole. I was like, no, it's not right. It's the commander well. Um, regardless. <laughs> podcast. Welcome to the commander hole, <laughs> where uh, we just keep digging deeper. We got to like, save that for the pre show. Yeah, I'll yeah. tell you what. It's like hornhole, but different. Uh, Edgar, <laughs> Edgar Markov, uh, in and of itself, as a magic card, is ridiculous. This is a twenty-six dollar sure. mythic. It's yeah. it's all, and it's also very expensive because it's really hard to reprint. Where are you going to reprint this card if yeah. not in a commander product? Like it's almost impossible without a special edition so and so or a secret layer or whatever. Um, but you know the card itself is terrific, and there are some fantastic EDH decks built around it. Um, for my number five, we start to get more uh, competitive. You know, we have to have more pedigree, essentially. This is a card that is weird. Like, there was definitely a point in time, this was around 2014, when Khan's Darker came out, where wizards would do things and they would put weird abilities on cards and you would go, why does this card have this ability? Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to make any flavor sense. It doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense for, like, you know, what the set's doing or whatever. But you go, wait a minute. It was so incredibly important that Anna Fins of the Foremost have a few certain keywords or key yep. phrases on her. Yeah. 
Anafins of the Foremost is a black, green, and a white mana for a 4-4 mythic legendary human soldier. Whenever she attacks, you put a plus one plus one counter on another target tapped creature you control. But here we go, if a creature card would be put into an opponent's graveyard from anywhere, exile it instead. Anywhere. 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 So like if you're doing a Seder Wayfinder thing, if you're doing a Sadisi thing, if it's combat, if you're forced to discard, I mean, Mm -hmm. it's anywhere. Like you need to kill this thing on site pretty much. Yeah. This card was, you know, you would, you would, I remember Abzan just having one of the best curves in standard where you would do like Warden of the Kin Tree, like the green white thing. Yep. And then you would do maybe like an Heir of the Wilds. And then you would do right. this. And then you would go into your Siege Rhino. And like you just couldn't keep up. Like this right. was a really, really dangerous card. Yeah. There was no deck that curved quite like that Abzan yeah. standard deck. Every single spot in the curve had a, had an all star all the way up to Wingmate Rock and then mm-hmm. the Planeswalkers at six. Yeah. Um, this Planes card was at four with Gideon Ally of Zendikar. Well, or that Sorin. As well. Yeah, the sure. Sorin. Yeah. Um, but uh, this card in particular, I mean, it's just such a powerhouse. I mean, look at all the words on a four, four for three. This like, was your number 10, you said? Me? No, I thought you said this was your number 10. No, 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 it's not. That's fine. Um, it is an incredibly powerful card, and you can definitely tell that design had their hands on it with the tapped that's stuck in there with the puzzle and puzzle counter. Mm-hmm. The graveyard hate ability, I believe I read in an article when they were talking about when they were designing the card that that came relatively late in design and development. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a spectacularly good card. Yeah, yeah. and uh, Kazuyuki Takimura had won the Pro Tour battle for Zendikar with Abzan, or Abzan Agro. Uh, yeah. With four anaphenses right there in the main deck, which is awesome. Let's move on here to surprising. I know, right? Moving here to number four, Ruben. What's your number four? My number four is another Pro Tour winning card, uh, and it is also in the cube. Um, now, the Pro Tour that it won was the Team Pro Tour, uh, but it was in Ben Hull's Hollow One deck mm. as a one of, and so still counts. I still count it. Um, you know, it, it, Delve is just an ability is what it is it's just an ability isn't it and what you could do is you could delve your entire graveyard away and so for a black mana you could just play tassiger the golden fang mm. uh, and then go to town tasker the golden fang otherwise known as uh mr bananas look at those bananas right there uh is five colorless and a black for legendary creature human shaman with delve each creature you exile from your graveyard while casting the spell pays for a colorless and it also has pay two colorless and two simic mana or green blue green blue put the top two cards of your library into your graveyard then return a non-land card of an opponent's choice from your graveyard to your hand Mm -hmm. so essentially what you could do is you could whittle away the cards you don't really want anymore and leave the one or two that are really good along with your fetch lands and whatever whatever other land ended up in there then start using that ability to draw a card and usually a relevant card every turn every time you spent four mana you can't fix broken mechanics you just <laughs> you can't they're broken that's the reason they're broken it's like yeah. you can't storm stop storming stop it you're not you're not going to fix that you're not going to make the card that makes everyone like storm make it somehow fair and make it somehow okay and the same thing is true of delve yeah. if you're trying to make something that's going to be a tournament all-star you're going to push too hard and it's going to break yeah. something if you'd go to if you go too far the other direction it's boring and stupid and why do we even have delve in the first place like it's just, it's just no there's no good point here like tasker if anything was among the best design delve cards mm-hmm. and still feels yeah. ridiculously overpowered as a one yeah. mana four or five at its worst it's just a tarmogoyf you know you get a four or five out of the deal mm-hmm. um you know this tends to see play in i mean i think it went all the way up to legacy at one point where you know the grixis right. delver decks were playing this because delve was better in the older formats because it was mm-hmm. so easy to fill your yard with right. your fetch lands and your gutaxian probes and things like that your force of wills mm-hmm. um and then you would have this engine where if you needed to go to the mid to late game you know not only did you have this body that could keep you alive from aggressive decks you also had a lot of fuel to keep you going and you would also specifically delve things that you wanted to get with this and so the card just did so much for so little um you know i remember playing with it in standard i played it in the esper dragons decks um you know i also played it in the sadisi decks there were just so many it was just such a flexible card and how could they make a promo or at least a new artwork in ultimate masters and not have the bananas i know yeah. that was Ash- like his thing mm-hmm. ashlyn rose's uh cosplay it features the bananas prominently mm-hmm. uh, yes as it, should. Of course, as, as it should as they should um i knew that we were in trouble when i was uh just walking the floor at pro tour dc 
right after this set came out. And I walked past Patrick Chapin. And I was like, ooh, Patrick Chapin. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I wonder what cool tech Patrick Chapin has at this modern, I think it was a, no, it was, it was an older format. Mm -hmm. uh, it might have been modern or something Modern like sounds about right. Yeah, I think it was a modern Pro Tour. I was like, oh, I wonder what, what cool tech there is. And I saw him exiling cards from his graveyard and playing what I thought was a bad card in Gurmag Angler. I was like, why are we playing a bad common? Right, limited common. I don't understand. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. oh, good <laughs> oh, and I realized boy. what what the problem. And then, of course, you know, treasure cruise and dig through time and everything from there. Absolutely. All right. Aaron, what's number four? My number four is one of my favorite commanders uh, to play against. I've never personally built a deck with this commander, but I always enjoy facing it. I played a really, really tense game with my friend Alec from Scotland the other day. Um, he yeah. was running this as his commander, and it just felt like it felt like the thumb screws were just being tightened. I'm like, oh no, we're so close to dying. We're so close to dying. Save us, somebody! And it was just, I just love this commander so much um, because it. it spirals out of control so quickly. My number four is Nekusar the Mind Razor. Um, mm. So Nekusar is two colorless, a blue, a black, and a red. It's a legendary creature zombie wizard with two power and four toughness. Uh, it says the beginning of each player's draw step, that player draws an additional card. But that's lovely. Like, what's the Very problem? nice. Um, and it says whenever an opponent draws a card, Nekusar deals one damage to that player. So mm. you play a lot of wheel effects. You're playing things with Megrim because you can't have all those cards in your hands. So you have to discard them. Um, you run things like Fevered Visions, and you have this really tense game of you know you're drawing seven and you're like oh no oh no and your life gets so low mm -hmm. um and then it, it was just a really really interesting game of just seeing how they're going to win with this um i, I just love this commander so much it does really nice grixis things and um I'm, I'm just a huge fan of this and very very enjoyable games god bless edhrec.com mm -hmm. um for showing things like uh riel the everwise for my Coria works really well with this obosh yeah can be an Obosh deck if you want to be in that. Uh, Underworld Dreams to kind of mm -hmm. double up on it. Spiteful Vision, same thing. Yeah. Uh, really interesting. Megram for when they're a discard in it. Like the, you get it coming and going as uh, <laughs> Reforge the Soul. Has, has been a, oh boy, Reforge the Soul. Mm -hmm. Nekusar has been a commander all-star since it was Elder Dragon Highlander. People mm -hmm. have been playing Nekusar decks and it's been a, that's a, Problem. Yeah, it came out in 2013, not just a couple years after they started making Commander stuff, and uh, they made a Judge promo, which is really nice, mm -hmm. worth about 28 bucks. And but just the idea that you can turn card draw into something lethal um, is, is just really great to watch. I think. Right, you're like, this is you know, we're getting everybody a hug. Everybody gets cards, mm -hmm. it's fine. And then trigger, 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 and they kill you. That's how it works. <laughs> Very nice. And having to choose which piece you want to deal with, because even the other day when we were playing, it was like, well, do I go for the Underworld Dreams? Do I go for it? Do I go for, like, you're, you're just kind of getting it from all angles, and you're like, I don't know. And, and really turning it into this team effort of, like, well, I can get rid of this, but we're still going to be dealing with that. And mm -hmm. you're all really in this boat. Like, it really does kind of unite you against that one thread of, like, what are we going to do? And Negasar <laughs> is at the helm. And hoping to God that one person that might have an answer doesn't die before the rest of you. Like, right. it's such a tense game. That's great. All right. My number four here is a card with a lot of, which is just some funny words on it. This is a card that like, it can just snap. And it did. I love glass cannon decks. Glass cannon decks are those decks that if you knew they're coming, if you understood what they're doing, you, you, you know, you'd be like, okay, I can put these four cards on my sideboard and play this way and you're dead. And then you have the decks that just show up out of nowhere, smash the tournament, go from zero to first place. Nobody else, and it's another key, no one else in the entire event is playing what you're playing. I love those the most. And the best example, the clearest example, is Jeskai Ascendancy. This Ooh. card was busted in the right deck <laughs> when you didn't know what was going on and you couldn't stop them. It was great. Jeskai Ascendancy is a red, a blue, and a white mana for a rare enchantment from Khans of Tarkir. It says whenever you cast a non-creature spell, creatures you control get plus one plus one until end of turn, untap those creatures. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, you may draw a card. If you do, discard a card. So you had drawing, you had untapping, you had getting creatures getting bigger, and it didn't take too long to form a loop with some really weird spells, but it actually got there. It's crazy, but Jeskai Ascendancy happened at the SG Tour. This, Ruben, you were there, right, for that it one? It was, yeah. Which was this absolutely was, amazing. This was a Retraction Helix, a Crowen, 
one one for one with heroic that made one ones mm -hmm. Sylvan carry added um, sometimes. So yeah, Sylvan carry added from mana. Now, of course, there was also the modern version that had more green in it, like Rattle yeah. Mystic, for example, that uh, uh, made a top eight of a Pro Tour. I want to say wow. in modern. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, there were combos with Jeskai Ascendancy that allowed you to essentially go infinite. It made you, all the creatures that were in play arbitrarily large or as well as large as the number of cards in your deck essentially yeah uh, and then you could kill your opponent from that point this one was my number 10 nice. um this one was the clear winner of the ascendancy cycle yeah uh, the only one that saw any real amount of play mm -hmm. and uh yeah just a really interesting weird card that when you put everything together there was nothing quite like a turn where you went off with just guys. There were folks calling for this to be banned before it even came out. Like there were people that saw this and saw the potential and were like, you can't, you cannot like, let this, this card's going to do terrible things. And... Exactly. And you know, it was good in the right deck. You know, it ended up not being, you know, dominant at all. I think it, it, yeah. again, it was another one of those weird summer decks where it's like, okay, you, know, you have this really large card pool to, to draw from. And then it's really, it's going to see like a little bit of modern play and no one's right. really going to talk about it. When pioneer happened, there was some talk about it maybe coming back, but it stayed down for the most part. But I always enjoyed watching this card go off. I've said before, I think it is healthy to have combo in a standard. I yeah. don't think the standard should not have combo ever. And I think this is this was a fine combo to I have agree. in standard. And I, I enjoyed seeing the pieces come together. Griber's purse they ran, so they could yeah. tap down your blockers. Like, I think this was great. Uh -huh. That's amazing. There are a few times when they get combo in standard and it works. Yeah. And I think this was one of those times. It's yeah. rare. It's hard to find. You want to make it a glass cannon combo right. deck. You want to make it like this is the best thing we're doing every turn four of the game from the standard till the next sure. set comes out. You know, you mean, no, if you do this one thing and you do it right and play these weird cards and you do this one strategy, it can work for you. And that's why I love that card. Yeah, so absolutely. We want here to my number three, which I don't have because it's higher on somebody else's list. Aaron, what's your number three? I said earlier in the show, I tried really hard not to pull cards that I've already talked about, but I do love this card so much. Um, you know, I can't talk about Sultai without talking about this card. This card was good enough and interesting enough to get me to play standard. It will always have a place in my heart. Uh, my number three, Sidisi Brood Tyrant. Mm. Um, so Sidisi is one colorless, a black, a green, and a blue. She is a legendary creature, Naga Shaman, who don't need no means. Uh, three power and three toughness. Whenever Sidisi enters the battlefield or attacks, put the top three cards of your library into your your graveyard and then whenever one or more creature cards is put into your graveyard from the library you put a 2-2 black zombie creature token onto the battlefield so you are playing things like Seder Wayfinder um, you know the incidental milling that you were doing and milling is now an official keyword thanks yeah. wizards um, would feed your whip of Erebos and so all of those things that you're putting in the graveyard not only are you getting 2-2 black zombies for your trouble but you're also getting whip of Erebos fodder things with enter the battlefield triggers like Hornet Queen um, and so you're able to gum up the board with two twos all of these things have lifelink you can take to the air with hornets you can bring in doom like giants um i loved sultai whip i was so sad when it rotated out she's never really seen any sort of modern play or older play i don't know of her too much in commander i've never faced her in commander but I've heard you could of a obviously people that have mm -hmm. her as commander yeah, i think I mean, bdm throw... has sidisi commander Oh yeah, they're out there. I just haven't personally faced them. Sure. So you could certainly slot her into any of the decks, but I'll just always have a place in my heart because I enjoyed Con Standard so much, largely yeah. on the back of this card. The fact that Sakura Tribe Elder will go get you a land and make a zombie token. <laughs> yeah. The fact that you can sacrifice any creature to Fiend Artisan to get a token that feeds Fiend Artisan <laughs> the next time to go get Fair whatever magic. you want. Yeah. Absolutely ridiculous, the fun it's things little, you can do. It's, it's a four mana grave titan mm -hmm. with upside like mm -hmm. that's better in a lot of situations and so yeah, yeah i mean city c whip um it, it takes a lot for a three color card we see a lot of three color decks mm -hmm. but those are mostly made up of one and two color cards that go well together it takes a lot for a three color card to be in a deck really mm -hmm. a competitive deck it's it's not just that the deck needs to be built you you're putting yourself under such a huge constraint of deck building right you're also putting yourself under a huge constraint of having the right mana in play in order to take advantage of the card i mean you even look at you know just luca in standard up until the recent bands didn't have any three color cards in it yeah. like that's not a mistake and so when you have something as powerful as sidisi that even has the deck named after it that's 
that's something else. Yes. And I can't forget Sidisi. Uh, I, I can't not mention her zombie tokens, like the zombies with the door knockers in the yeah. heads. Oh, they were so cool and so soul tie. I, I still those. use those. Nice. I, I have different kinds of zombie tokens, but sometimes I'm feeling soul tie and I'll bring out the knockers, you know. Just... Nice. Uh, Sir Conrad is also another terrific card to use with Sidisi. Very, very Ooh. nice. Yeah, All right. Ruben, what's your number three? My number three is the last hire that is on someone else's list. Well, mine too. So let's move on here to number two. Ruben, what's number two? My number two is a card that I have great love for. It has, it actually has a Pro Tour win. I, uh, well, maybe not a Pro Tour win, um, but it certainly has a Grand Prix win. Um, it has uh, a, a top flight win in that it won Eternal Weekend Vintage uh, in 2019. Uh, defeating the power overwhelming of PO at the time. Um, and uh, it, it's it's had a lot of great success in Legacy. It's had a lot of great success uh, up until being banned in Commander. It's the second card on my list that has been banned. Uh, and I've also been the voice of this character uh, for Voice of All. My number two is Leovold, Emissary of Trest. Mm -hmm. My number six. Nice. My number Leovold. three. There you go. Leovold, Emissary of Trust, is banned in Commander, and with good reason. Originally from Conspiracy Take the Crown, Leovold is black, green, blue for a 3-3. Elf Advisor, it's a mythic, of course. Each opponent can't draw more than one card each turn, and whenever you or a permanent you control become the target of a spell or ability an opponent controls, you may draw a card. Mm. Jeepers and yikes. That So, that first line, <laughs> It turns out is the headliner. I thought the second line was going to be the headliner, and it usually is. It, that it is, line but they can't brainstorm. Play anymore. that, and they can't thought seize you, and they can't, you know, abrupt decay your creature without giving you some advantage. Oh, by the way, when you reforge the soul, when you time twister, when your opponent tries to brainstorm or Jace, nope, can't do that. Can't yeah. that, that ain't going to work out well for you. Yeah. And uh, it, it's all on a three three, like it's just mm -hmm. a massive body to be able to do all of that. And it's funny because you would think that the mana cost would be prohibitive, but you know, this came out at a time when Deathrite Shaman had never been better. And so, right. you know, you were playing with Deathrite Shaman, you were playing with this, it, this card was in, was not hard to cast at all. And so it really put bug decks on the map. It eventually evolved into the check pile decks where you yep. could run, you know, Deathrite Shaman, this Kolagon's Command, True Name Nemesis and Wasteland because why the hell not? Um, and has even seen vintage play, you know, bug has been, bug it tends to be the fair deck in vintage which, you know, Death Ray Shaman is legal in. Um, but now you have things like Arkham's Astrolabe that can also help you cast this card because mana just doesn't matter anymore. And so, you know, when you're playing a format that's built around brainstorms and ponders and things like that, um, or you're doing a for or you're in a format where dredging is happening, if you don't have a dredger in the yard, um, you can't dig, you can't find your answers. And so this card can really be damning um, in those games. And like you said, even just on a 3-3 body, that's a big butt you have to get through. And so yeah. um, just a powerhouse card that has had just multi-format um, just had an impact on multiple formats and in, in a way I don't know if they were expecting it's also a card that were. if you look at the price history like this guy was like a hundred bucks or something uh -huh. at one point like it was mythic insane from a non-standard set right so. a mythic from conspiracy take the crown and the foil was like eight million dollars and oh, now yeah. you can get a copy of them for four bucks which is yeah. like ridiculous which is fun <laughs> which is great i like yeah. that keep it accessible i just remember like the the heights this card yeah. got to were it was i remember all the cards. rules interactions where like you would just be playing a game of magic and then you'd walk into it and you'd be like oh Damn it. <laughs> Dang it. Reanimator? Yeah. Nice grizzle brand, fool. Mm -hmm. uh, Aaron, what's number two? My number two is just one of my favorite commanders of all time. I got the chance to play with her this past weekend. My boyfriend likes to say that it's my blue deck um, because I, I tend to gain a lot of card advantage and I don't often do very much with her. I tend to do things at instant speed. I also lovingly refer to that deck as don't make me get off the couch. Uh, my number two is Queen Marchesa. Um, so Queen Marchesa is one colorless, a red, white, and a black for a legendary creature human assassin with three power and three toughness. She has death, touch, and haste. When Queen Marchesa enters 
this battlefield, you become the monarch. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning of your upkeep, if, a, if an opponent is the monarch, you get a 1-1 one, one black assassin creature token with death touch and haste onto the battlefield. So very flavorful card. You know, the idea of when Marchesa does lose her crown, you get this assassin that you can use to get the crown back, similar to the way that she did. Um, I remember getting these cute little crowns in the conspiracy packs. And so mm -hmm. I still have my crown and I, I have it up here on top of my Funko Pops. Um, and it's just one of my favorite decks. You know, you can build Marchesa so many different ways. Um, I've seen it done as a token deck. I've seen it done as, a, as just um, a, a pillow fort deck with enchantments. Mm -hmm. I tend to play mine as more of a control deck. I like to have a lot of white instants in my deck to where you think that the shields are down. And then I cast Settle the Wreckage and then I laugh at you. And so um, I just love this card. I love the feeling. I love the response. People love this card when you say Marchesa. People will usually reply with long may she reign. And so I'm um, just one of my favorite characters in Magic yeah. Lore. And I just feel so good when I'm playing this deck. Yeah, I love uh, the Monarch so much. I love yes. that ability so much. It made combat, early combat, like turn two, three, four combat, mm -hmm. relevant in Commander, which it wasn't really. Um, and it, it's nice to be able to be like, wow, attacking with a 1-1 one, one into my 30 life means something. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really cool. It adds an additional layer of politics to an already political game. You know, yeah. you're already playing Commander, but now you have this, you know, do I care about the Monarch? How much do I care about the Monarch? You know, and even when you play her, you know, she's one of those Commanders you don't necessarily want to run out on turn four. You know, you want to make sure that you have a No Mercy up or a Ghostly Prison up. Right. Or sometimes if you're just hard up for cards, you might slam her on turn four just to get something you need. And um, I love the way she just changes the game. Uh, she works incredibly well with General's Enforcer from yeah. Ikoria. Ooh. Two mana, two, three, that legendary humans you control have indestructible. I like that. Which is a, a pretty saucy choice. Yeah, I'm excited to pair that. I'm excited to put Mangara in here, where it's yeah. just like, New attack Mangara. me. Sure. <laughs> Please attack New me. Mangara is yes. nice. That's yeah. very nice. All right. <clears throat> My number two uh, is a card that I've spoken about before. It is a card that... <clears throat> That I mean, looking back, I mean, it's one of those things that this was this was made in 2007. It's been 13 freaking years since this card has shown up, which is kind of incredible. Um, time passes, particularly in Magic, it feels like so quickly, yet slowly. You know what I mean? Like we're kind of tired of Vicoria draft right now, but like it's it's going to be gone in a few weeks, and then we're going to have to just talk about it, you know, in, in the rear view. Uh, so this is a card that I love the story behind this card. The fact that Aaron Forsyth and I believe it was Mark Rosewater were at lunch and they were like, what are we supposed to do for this tree folk and Lorwyn? And they're like, well, what if we just had it, you know, assign damage equal to toughness? Because that would be really cool and you can make a 0-11 and it would be really exciting or whatever. Uh, and that's exactly what they did because they made Doran the Siege Tower. Doran is green, black, white mana for a 0-5 rare legendary tree folk shaman. And each creature assigns combat damage equal to its toughness rather than its power. Now, they took this and kind of ran with it for the new Watley um, and, uh, and yeah. High Alert, I think is the card. And I've played those and decks. Arcades, the strategy. And Arcades certainly, yeah. yeah. And that's great. And I love because it, it makes you kind of think about magic and creatures and the magic enchantments you have or whatever differently. And it makes combat totally different and totally unique. Uh, you know, yeah, they're starting to throw it around in a lot of different cards. But, like, this was the OG. This was a super cool card from back in the day. I loved it. I had the extended art, like, States version or whatever yeah. for a very long time States in my queue. Yep. yep. It was very cool. Uh, just, just a lot of love for this guy. Super great. Yeah, this was my number three. Nice. Um, I have Our number two is number three were flipped. <laughs> yep, exactly. I mean, Doran, what can you say about Doran? I mean, it, it won Worlds in the hands of Uri Peleg, the first Israeli world champion mm. um, at Worlds in 2007 in New York, which we were there for. Yeah. Uh, later, it very nearly won another Pro Tour in the hands of Brad Nelson when he was runner-up at Pro Tour Amsterdam in 2010. Mm. Uh, oh, by the way, Brian Kibler also played Doran at that Pro Tour. Um, to make a top eight. I mean, this card is a three color card that created a three color deck around itself. And it's like one of the only cards. It's like, it's, it's one of the first cards that did that. And still right. it Sidisi and very few others have been able to pull off that feat in standard. The idea that you could have a three man of five, five, that not only was a three man of five, five, had no drawback and even had more upside to work with different cards in different ways. 
That was not seen in 2007. We didn't yeah. get those kind of goodies where it's good on good on good. And that's why those decks existed, because we never got something like that back then. It was incredible. Let's move on here to our number one. Now, uh, Ruben and I share a number one. So, Aaron, what is your number one? My number one is a card that I have spoken of lovingly. It's become associated with me. Uh, Inked Playmats had recently posted a, a pack of sleeves with this card on it. Um, and somebody tagged me and was like, Aaron, you you need these sleeves in your life. And I was like, I do need these sleeves in my life. And then Inked Playmats was like, do you want them? We'll just, we'll just send them to you. you. You want a pack of sleeves? And I was like, okay. <laughs> Um, and before I knew it, a week later, the sleeves showed up and they matched my play mats. Uh, and they're all um, featuring my favorite commander, which is Muldrotha the Great Tide. Yay. Um, so Muldrotha is three colorless. She's a black, a green, and a blue for a legendary creature, Elemental Avatar. Um, $13 right now. What? Wow. $36 foil. Wow. I had no idea. What is finance? Um, mm -hmm. Six powers, six toughness. During each of your turns, you may play up to one permanent card of each permanent type from your graveyard. Mm. So your graveyard essentially turns into this giant toolbox. And so um, it leads to some interesting deck building restrictions. You don't want to play a lot of instants and sorceries. You sure. really want permanence. So you want your, your discs, you want your mana dorks, but you don't want them to necessarily tap for mana. You want your wood elves, you want your satyr wayfinders, you want your merciless executioners, you want your removal spells to be on a body, you want your enchantments and things of that nature. So I love the deck building restrictions. I love that it's so powerful. You don't even have to go that hard with it. Like you can put a lion's eye diamond in here, but I promise you, you don't have to go that hard. Like the card is just that good. I love the way that you play your turns of like, okay, did I play my artifact? Did right. I play my enchantment? If you're feeling really nasty, you can blink it with Dead Eye Navigator and then reset the claws. So you'll get a fresh round of permanence to play. I just love everything about it. I love the art. I love the flavor text, just saying that she grew and she bloomed. It just makes me so happy. Yeah, there's uh, tons and tons of good stuff you could be doing. Uh, for example, the seals, seal of primordium, uh, pernicious deed is a really Absolute nice one. Capsule, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. um, you know, Sakura tribe elder can go get you lands every turn. Shriek maw kills stuff. Mold drifter. One goes of the and ways that cards. I knew oh, I was interested really in my boyfriend was he had a persistent petitioners version with this, and I was like, I think I'm attracted to you. <laughs> nice persistent petitioners. Moldrotha is kind of hilarious. And you took it nice. apart, and I'm like, baby, <laughs> put it back together. I mean, really throw don't. in your Gitrog monsters. Throw in your animate deads. Yes! Like, and your fetch lands too. Like, Dreamborn Muse. I mean, you could have some um, fun. I really like the interface that Arena has for the Muldrotha effect and for the Kethis effect of like, mm -hmm. and Loris for that matter, which is look at these things. You need to be able to like drag the the trigger that you want to trigger on into the, onto the battlefield and be like, all right, which one do you want now? And right. I really like how that interacts. Um, really cool card. Uh, my biggest. Um, or my most experience playing with Muldrotha was in Dominaria draft, mm -hmm. where this card was an absolute all-star. 6-6 six, six for 6 with no ability is going to be a pretty good card, much less one that lets you play 3, 4, 5 more cards every turn forever. Yeah. Um, if your opponent doesn't have any graveyard hate, and that just means every card that ever dies comes back the next turn if you want it to. Yeah. Yeah, this card was a metric bomb in Dominaria draft. Um, you know, it's funny. You can't really say these days that a six mana six six is all that good. Because no. <laughs> they give us like six to... mana seven sixes right on the worms or whatever, yeah. and we're like, okay, I mean, you it's had fine. access to Kinder Catch in like uh, mm -hmm. Innistrad Limited. Now we're getting six sixes for five. That whenever they attack or block, you get a three three, or you draw a card, or you gain life. Apparently, like that card is now. ridiculous. Um, yeah. And then they're like, "It's too to see play because it's a fairy law." I'm like, yeah, "Okay, it dude." Do anything. It doesn't All do right. anything. The turn it comes into play, it just goes in your questing beast block of text tribal. There yeah. you go. <laughs> block of text tribal. That's <laughs> that's my favorite. All right. So for our number one, uh, it, it I don't know if it's a default, but. Let's it's face it, it's a default because until they make another specifically wedge set and yeah. they say this is a wedge set, so we want to push back on the Obzon, or if we go back to cons, for example, yeah. I would be happy to go back to cons of Tarkir and see what they sort of ultimately came up with as a follow up to one of the most powerful, impactful. They always have two or more. That's what always killed me. Yeah, oh, there yeah. was never one Siege Rhino. There were two or more Siege Rhinos in that hand. Seven. Nice. Ruben, what does it do? 
So Siege Rhino, what doesn't it do? Siege Rhino really? is a colorless, a white, a black, and a green for probably one of the best rhinos that has ever been printed. It's yeah. a four or five with trample, uh, originally from Cons of Tarkir. When Siege Rhino enters the battlefield, each opponent loses three life and you gain three life. Mm -hmm. mm. So so what's what what is the downside here? <laughs> the there downside isn't... God. When I believe that it was Chapin who wrote that the downside is that it costs one more and you have to lose, you know, have to gain three life and your opponent has to lose three life instead of it merely being a three mana four or five with trample. Yeah. It yeah. Like, this card is so unreasonable. This card and the fact that they bounce off of each other, you know, yeah. so Siege Rhinos just stare off and then you can't attack once they have two because they can double block. So you'd have these giant board states that just kept on going forever and ever. Like this is of its era. It wasn't close that this was the best creature in standard. This thing was absolutely ridiculous. And Siege Rhino yeah. like dominated from the minute it showed up to the minute it left. Yep. Yeah, I mean, this was good enough to be seen playing modern. You know, birthing pod was still a thing, so you could pot into this, you could cord into this. Um, you know, the, like you said, you know, you never had just one. And we were coming off of the, you know, this card really established this trend of like green mid range cards that took you to the late game. We got right. really, really spoiled when Thrag Tusk came out. And then when Thrag Tusk left, we were like, what's going to be that buffer? What's going to be that thing to carry us through? And then we had Corsair of Crew Fix, and then we lost Corsair of Crew Fix. And we were like, we had to get, we had to keep our high going. We had to get a new fix. And then this card came out. And, you know, it was just another one of those cards in that long line of green cards or cards that had green in them that would carry you from the mid to the late game and help you recover and also just help you close out games. But that also ends our top 10 list of the wedge spells. You'll see them on the screen now for your review. Take a look at my list, Aaron's list, Ruben's top 10, and we want to hear from you about what card we did not talk about. And we'll select our favorite to win a $50 gift certificate to, cool, <laughs> gift certificate to CoolStuffInc.com. But before we go, I want to thank my co-host. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you. And once more, shout out to Wedge. Very nice. <laughs> As we move here to our final slide, I want to thank our sponsor, CoolStuffInc.com, our co-sponsor, CardWarder.com, my co-host, Aaron Camel and Ruben Bressler. You guys for watching or listening, and hope you support us at Patreon.com slash Magic Mics. Follow, like, tweet, favorite, share, subscribe to everything social that tells people we exist. Catch us online at Twitch.tv at Magic Mics, on Twitter at Magic Mics Cast, our Magic Mics subreddit, and like the Magic Mics page on Facebook. Talk to us privately at Magic Mics Podcast at gmail.com. Follow the audio-only podcast at Magic Mics Podcast .com, or find us on iTunes and Spotify, or join us here next week, same time, same place, for another episode of Magic Mics. Good night, everybody.